All right, it looks like we're live. So I'm gonna actually scoot my penguin over here a little bit. There we go. Oh, I pushed him out. <laughs> okay, all right. So welcome everybody back to Life Science Live. I hope you all had a wonderful break and a great Christmas and a happy new year. Um, today, we are going to talk about penguins. Oh, I see we've got people watching, hello. <laughs> okay, yeah, so today we're gonna talk about penguins. I figured it's pretty cold outside and we're all still in winter mode and penguins are pretty commonly associated with the cold. But we're actually gonna talk a little bit about that today because we're going to debunk some popular penguin myths. So you can see next to me, I've got, I have a black-footed penguin. This is an Adelie penguin. And then this big guy here is an emperor penguin just down there at the bottom of my screen. And we'll kind of bring them in a little bit and just talk about penguins in general. And that first myth we're gonna talk about, like I mentioned, is that all penguins live in the ice and snow. So this is partly true. I mean, you can probably guess because we've seen so much of it. We see penguins in advertisements and we see penguins in cartoons and in art and in movies and they're almost always in the cold. So there has to be a reason. And that's because a lot of penguins do live where it's pretty cold. I have some pictures here to show you guys of the range maps of penguins. So altogether, there are 18 species of penguins. I don't know if we can get that to turn, there we go. Ooh, that light is hard to see. All right, so this blue color down here on the screen is where penguins live in general, out of all the species of penguins. And if you look at it, you'll notice that all of those penguins live on the southern half of the world. So no penguin species live north of the equator. Unless you count, you can kind of count this guy right here. This is the Galapagos Islands. There's one species of penguin there called the Galapagos penguin. And they're pretty much right on the equator. So a few of them might come a little bit north, but for the most part, they all live south of the equator. So you won't ever find penguins and polar bears living in the same place. A lot of times you'll see pictures of them together on Christmas cards and things like that, but they'll actually never interact in the wild because polar bears all live north in the northern, uh, northern hemisphere up in the Arctic. All penguins live down in the Antarctic and then on the coasts and on some islands down south of the equator. Um, the Galapagos penguin that I mentioned, this is him right there, that's the one that lives on the Galapagos Islands. So a lot of species of penguins actually live on tropical islands and tropical coasts like that. Um, my little black-footed penguin over here, I'll bring him closer to the screen so you can see him. He lives in Africa. He's also sometimes called an African black-footed penguin. And they live on the southern coast of Africa and they're kind of in a temperate or subtropical habitat there. So the water can still be pretty cold, but in general, the habitat's not always icy and snowy. Um, I'm gonna show you that little picture again. So you can see Africa is pretty far away from Antarctica. There are two species of penguins that live on the continent of Antarctica all year round. One of those is the emperor penguin, the really big one down here. Um, there are a couple others that live on islands right around Antarctica. That's why you see this blue range extending up quite a bit. But out of those, those four species, those are the only ones that spend all their time in Antarctica or the close islands. The rest of them will spend at least part of the year in a warmer place, especially when they're nesting and they need more food for their, their chicks. Um, make sure that I touched on every little bit of that myth. Oh, so they don't live, not all of them live in the cold, but those that do, they don't even live at the South Pole. So sometimes you'll hear people say like, polar bears live at the North Pole and penguins live at the South Pole, but they actually never make it all the way to the South Pole. Now this little picture is a good way to see it. So it's kind of the same map as the other one, but it's showing the earth from the bottom. You're seeing the bottom of the globe here. Um, so you can see Antarctica in the middle. Here's, what is that, Australia? <laughs> Just right here. So I'll zoom in a little bit. 
So you can see those penguins that live on the coast of Australia. You've got some that live on the coast of New Zealand, some that live over here in South America, and right here is Antarctica. And you'll notice that all of those penguins live around the coastline. So these little letters represent the types of penguins that live there. The E is the emperor penguin. The A is the Adelie penguin. And that's this one right here. It's one of the other penguins that lives in Antarctica. But neither of them make it all the way to the middle of the continent. Antarctica is basically a giant ice desert. And so all the penguins that live there stick close to the coast where they can access their food. And they won't really migrate all the way to the middle. The South Pole is way far inland and it's really cold and frozen. And in order to get there, they'd have to walk all that way because we all know penguins can't fly. So getting to the South Pole would take way too long. They wouldn't have any food. You hear about emperor penguins kind of migrating to come farther inland to raise their chicks and then they'll go to the ocean and then come back. You might've seen March of the Penguins with the whole movie about that. Um, but they still don't go as far in as the South Pole is. They just go a little farther in from the coast. All right. So, yeah, <laughs> so that's all for um, penguins living in the cold. Our next myth is that penguins mate for life. And this is not true in pretty much any species. So some might be monogamous, and that means that one male and one female will stick together for a whole breeding season. Um, but usually that doesn't last for an entire lifetime of a penguin. It sort of depends on how successful the pair is. So some penguins will get together for a mating season, and then if they're really good at raising their chicks and a lot of them survive, then they might breed again the next year and keep doing that for a little while. But most of the time, they'll kind of switch around between breeding seasons. And sometimes they'll even switch around within a breeding season, even if that species is mostly monogamous. So penguins aren't perfectly faithful all the time. And then the next one's kind of connected with that. It's that penguin chicks stay with their parents for a really long time. A lot of times you see those cute movies like we talked about where the, the penguins are getting raised by their parents and they stick around for a long time, but that's not true for a lot of species of penguins. The king penguin, which looks pretty similar to the emperor penguin, I think I actually have a little picture of him here, is the one that sticks with its parents the longest. So you can see he's the second biggest penguin species, and he looks pretty similar to the emperor penguin. Let me see if I have... The only difference is that the emperor penguin, its color doesn't quite connect up here, and it's bigger. And that's the easiest way to tell them apart in pictures. You can see he has this sort of gray patch that connects all the way around. Um, the king penguin stays with its parents for about 13 months, so over a year. And that's the longest one, but for the most part, they'll only stay for about a month until those baby penguins get their adult feathers and can hunt by themselves. So the, the Adelie penguin and the black-footed penguin, both of those, the, the chicks stick around for maybe seven weeks at the most, but sometimes as, low, as little as 30 days. Um, once their adult feathers come in and they can hunt by themselves, their parents will just stop feeding them. So the, it's kind of sad. The chicks will sometimes follow their parents around and beg for food and then the parents just run away and <laughs> try to teach them to go off on their own. There's another kind of penguin, though the one we talked about already actually, the Galapagos penguin, that will grow up and learn how to feed itself, but it will also just kind of stick around its nest like long after it gets its feathers and it will mooch off of its parents for a while. Um, that way it can keep getting a little bit of extra food, but it also hunts by itself. Um, there's only a couple penguin species that do that. And some people think actually that this has helped the Galapagos penguin to, to survive because it's an endangered species. Um, but because those chicks kind of have a higher survival rate because they're staying around their parents, it kind of helps them to get older and keep recruiting from, uh, keep having successful, successful young. All right, connected with cute baby penguins is the idea that penguins are super cute and cuddly, and sometimes when you see them waddling around, you kind of just want to give them a big hug. But they're actually, they're not entirely cuddly. They are pretty cute, <laughs> but they can bite really hard. I'll grab my, uh, my black-footed penguin again over here. So if you look at this big, tough beak, you can see this is very, very hard beak, and he can bite very, very hard with it. Penguins hunt fish, we all, have a pretty good idea of that. Their bodies are shaped just right for it. 
and they have to have really strong beaks in order to catch those slippery fish and keep them from getting away. So penguins can bite really hard, they can draw blood, <laughs> and you probably don't want to just go walk up to a wild penguin. Not that any of us live in the southern hemisphere though, so you don't have to worry about that too much. <laughs> um, also, you don't have to worry too much about being chased down by a penguin because they are pretty slow on land. They've got these teeny little legs and they just waddle around. So they might only really be intimidating if they're as big as an emperor penguin, which I'll see if I can get you guys a good view of the one down here on the floor. So this emperor penguin is about three to four feet tall in the wild. And <laughs> I wish that I had sort of a better angle on him. I'm gonna try to stand next to him where you can see him. There we go. So you can see he comes almost about up to my waist. I'm a pretty short person, but if I was to have this guy come running at me, I don't think I would think he was very cute. <laughs> and he has a pretty long, sharp beak, again, for catching those fish. So you wanna keep your distance from penguins, even though they are pretty adorable when they're waddling around. There are some really cute penguin species out there though. So this tallest guy, the emperor penguin, is pretty big, but the littlest one is called a little penguin. Very creative name. <laughs> and they are super tiny. They're only about one foot tall. And they're also sometimes called blue penguins or fairy penguins because they have that blue color and they're super small and cute. I think fairy penguin is most common, uh, the most common name for them in Australia, but the kind of official name for them is just the boring little penguin, <laughs> which is still, it's still a cute name. But yeah, so you can see this guy feeding him there, feeding the, the penguins. They're barely taller than his boot. So penguins have a really big range in size. Um, we've seen lots of different colors and, and shapes of penguins. And that all depends on where they live and what kind of habitat is available for them. All right, the last myth that we're gonna talk about is the idea that penguins came from birds that never evolved flight. So a long time ago, people used to think that penguins were like a half bird, half fish hybrid thing. They also thought maybe that, that penguins were the missing link between uh, like fish and creatures in the ocean and then like birds and things that can fly. Um, but through studying them and learning about their, their ancestry and their evolution, we found that the ancestors of penguins could actually fly. So if you look at a penguin, it has these funny little tiny flippers that would be super useless if it was trying to fly anywhere. But a long time ago, the ancestors of penguins were flying birds. And over time, based on the habitats that they lived in, they found that it was more effective to swim. So they swam through the water and the more successful babies were the ones that were better at swimming. And so over time, their flying wings started to kind of shrink and their bodies became more streamlined and torpedo shaped and they turned into what we have today over lots and lots of generations and so now we have penguins that swim and can't fly and you can see a lot of the really cool adaptations that develop from that they have these super sharp uh, short stiff feathers on their wings that make it really easy to just slip through the water they can push really fast they have these webbed feet Get a good look at them here. So they have webbing between their toes that helps them to paddle through the water. Their feathers are very short and stiff and you can see they're really sleek. So as they glide through the water, they don't have much resistance on their body. And that's the same with the shape overall as well. When a penguin is going through the water, it really does look a lot like a little torpedo. And then their feathers are also waterproof. So it keeps that water from getting down into their downy feathers and soaking them. If that happens, then it would be harder for them to swim and it would be a lot harder for them to stay warm. Even in those tropical places where some of the penguins live, the water can still be really cold. So it's important for them to have feathers that keep the water out and also to have a nice layer of blubber or fat that keeps their body warm. Um, oh, another thing that's really cool uh, that came from their adapting to swimming through the water is their coloration. So pretty much every species of penguin has a dark black back and a white belly. And that's because if you were a predator who wanted to eat a fish, or not a fish, a penguin, you would be looking at it either from above the water, so the penguin swims like this, and its predators are flying above the water looking for something they can dive down to grab. 
But if you look at a penguin from the top and you're looking down into the dark, dark depths of the ocean, you're going to see a dark back. So the penguin doesn't really stand out against the water because he has this dark coloration on the top. And then if you're maybe a shark or a leopard seal, which are some pretty common predators of penguins that live in the water, you're going to be swimming underneath, looking up for things that are swimming above you that you might want to try to eat. And so if the penguin's swimming like this again, you look up and you see the sun shining down into the water. And so everything above you is super bright. And so when the penguin swims over, he has this white colored belly. And so he blends right in with the light all above. And so it's really, really useful for these penguins to have a dark back and a white belly so that they don't stand out from either side. Another cool thing about their feathers is that when a penguin molts, it can be dangerous for them because the water can get in, they have patchy feathers, they can get really cold. So in order to reduce the amount of time that they spend losing feathers, they actually molt all at once. It's called a catastrophic molt because it looks really terrible. Let me show you a picture of, of what that might look like. If my little guy will listen here. There we go. And so this is a picture of a, of a penguin molting, possibly a black-footed penguin there. So you can see their feathers just come off and they look like they might be sick. You might have seen this actually if you've been to a zoo before where they had penguins. There will be a penguin that just looks really bad and most of the time it's because it's hit its molt. And so all of its feathers fall off within a couple weeks and they all grow back. So the penguin doesn't really get to eat during that time, which means it, it probably gets really hungry. But it has to molt all of its feathers, it can't go in the water. And then once those feathers grow back, then it's good for the rest of the rest of the time it takes for it to molt again, however often that might be. All right, and that is all that I had for penguins today. So if you guys have any questions or anything that I didn't touch on in the video that you would like to know about, you can put those questions into the comments and I'll try to keep an eye on those so that I can answer them for you. I hope that you have a great rest of your week and we'll see you next Friday. Bye.